Hello everyone! Today we'll be going over everything you need to know about guild missions. What they are, the benefits, all the different types, how to run them smoothly, different ways to do them for different sized groups, ways to cheese some for new guilds, and some general tips for each. I'll go over each of these in sections, so as always, I have timestamps for each section as well as for every individual mission should you only need information on a few. I'll be using what footage I've been able to grab myself and inserting images for those I couldn't. Any and all links to images and pages will be in the description as well. If you're looking to understand guilds as a whole, like how they work, how to start one, benefits, etc., I've linked Muckluck's guide on all basics, both here in the upper right hand corner and also in the description. If you need more visuals than what I include, I've linked Iron Maiden's playlist back when guild missions were first made. The routes are the same, but some of the information is now outdated, so just a heads up. On to the guide! What are guild missions and what do they do for you, the player? Guild missions are a variety of timed, cooperative activities guild members do together to benefit both themselves and the guild itself with currencies. Commendations are for the players, favor is for the guild. Favor earned can be seen by opening your guild tab in the top left or pressing G and looking in the right bottom of the guild panel. 6k favor cap at one time in general and 2k cap per week from missions. To see your commendations, open your inventory tab in the top left or by pressing I, going to your wallet, the little stacked coin icon, and looking for the guild commendations with the little crest icon. You earn one or two per mission depending on the difficulty level. One for easy and medium, two for hard. And you can even farm these by doing different guild missions with other guilds, if they have other options due to a preference difference like the guild choosing between PvP, World v. World, or PvE, or no preference, or level difference. You cannot do the same missions, however, even if it's with a different guild. For example, you can't earn more commendations by doing the easy trek again if you've already done it with another guild that week. You can, however, spend those commendations at any guild vendor of the guild you're representing, as they're universal for all guilds you're in, unlike Favor, which is just earned for the specific guild the missions were ran for while the missions were active. These missions reset and change weekly on Mondays at 2.30 a.m. UTC. Speaking of missions being active, let's quickly go over how to start them, cancel them, and check for credit. In order to start a guild mission, assuming you have the guild permission mission control, you just need to go to your guild panel, go to the third tab down for guild missions, and hit launch mission under whichever you decide to do. Time limits to do these missions will change depending on the mission type and difficulty, and there is a short time penalty if you cancel a mission and need to restart, usually just 300 seconds. Any canceling that needs to be done will be the same button used to start them. This will not prevent you from starting other missions, however. If you do not know if you've received credit after completion, usually by seeing a wiggly event completion chest in your bottom right hand corner of the screen, simply open your guild missions tab and check if the chest icon by that mission is open and glowing, which means credit received, or closed, which means not received. This is also how you'll see if the guild itself got credit, shown by a golden shield, credit received, or an empty shield slot, not received. There are some missions where you can receive personal credit even if the guild does not complete it and receive credit, like the treks and races we'll go over later on, and this helps remind you which missions you've already gotten commendations for if you've participated with another guild you're in. Guild missions can come in many flavors, but the overall three categories are the different types of gameplay they're based on. World versus world, player versus player, and player versus environment. These categories are listed in the guild missions tab in the guild window and are the areas in which these take place. The world versus world ones tend to be some sort of capture, rank gain, or escort objectives with one jump puzzle possibility in the world v world tab maps. PvP tends to be stat, win, or task objectives in the PvP lobby tab, and PvE comes in with the highest variety, all of which are in the core Tyria maps. Those being Trex, Hide and seek with glowing circles in the world, bounties, hunting down certain targets in specific maps, races, obstacle courses well transformed, puzzles, large multi room puzzles, and challenges, usually protecting, escorting, defeating NPCs, or surviving a tower defense type game. The general gameplay area your guild prefers can actually be implemented if you so choose. This can be changed by clicking the white cog near the top center of your missions tab in your guild panel. The first week of your guild being created will always be the no preference, which means you will get a mix of all types of mission gameplay areas. While this does give 10% more favor, and many larger guilds have this anyway, it sometimes is easier for new players to have this set to whatever game mode they will do together most or have the most experience in, typically being PvE. Checking a different section of gameplay missions will ensure that specific choice is what your missions will be in from then on, starting that following reset time of Monday at 2.30 a.m. UTC until you change it again. On to the actual missions themselves. I'll go in order of the wiki for ease, and since the PvE section will be the longest, it'll be the last. Any and all tips I can give for each 
each one will be implemented then or in a subsection just before those related missions. For World v World, you will need at least three players to represent during the mission and take part. More are recommended depending on the difficulty of the actual mission, but large groups are not required. Groups of 10 or smaller do just fine, and for some, you can just buddy system it to capture multiple objectives in a shorter time. All missions under World v World and their difficulties and times are as follows. World v World Capture Camps World v World Mission where members must capture a specified number of objectives within the specified amount of time, this being a camp. There is easy, medium, and hard. The recommended players for each goes up by 5 starting at 5, but the required number of players is only 3. The mission targets are capture 1 camp, capture 2 camps, and capture 3 camps respectively with their different difficulties all within 15 minutes. World v World Capture Sentry Points The same thing, except the mission targets are capture 3 sentry points, capture 5 sentry points, and capture 10 sentry points, all for easy, medium, and hard. World v World Capture and Hold World v World Mission where members must capture and hold an objective until it reaches a certain tier within a time limit. For easy, medium, and hard, these are all the same basic type thing for the same time limit, just different types of objectives within a certain amount of time. So for easy, it's capture and hold one camp until it reaches tier one. Medium is a tower until it reaches tier one, and hard is a keep until it reaches tier one. World v World Challenge Obsidian Sanctum Simply do the jump puzzle in the Obsidian Sanctum, which has its own World v World map. You will still see enemy players here, but normally it's fairly empty or people will leave each other alone for the most part, since they may also want to work on the puzzle for themselves or their guild. The puzzle itself is fairly easy, just a few sketchy jump portions, a dark room, and some wins you'll have to dodge through. This one can even be done alone if needed or if you just want to keep a low profile anyway. World v World Supply Lines World v World Mission in which members must escort caravans to objectives within a specific time limit. For easy, it's just escorting three Doliaks in 20 minutes. For both medium and hard, they have the shared time limit of 25 minutes, but medium requires five Doliaks while hard requires eight Doliaks. There are plenty of short spaces between certain keeps and towers and camps that should make this fairly easy. World v World Rank World v World Mission in which members must earn a certain amount of World v World experience within a time limit. For this one, there is no required amount of players, but it does help the more players you have. For Easy, Medium, and Hard, these all have the same time limit but vary in the rank points. For Easy, it's 10,000, Medium, 25,000, and Hard, 50,000. PvP For PvP, all missions specify a guild team. This will have you create a PvP team for the guild and ensure three or more guild members are in a party together, or else you will not be able to complete these specific missions. Here on screen, I'll show you exactly how to create a PvP team. You only need to make this once for the sake of missions and can just reuse this one in future weeks as well. The section to make said team is the tab below the guild missions tab. All missions under PvP and their difficulties and times are as follows. PvP Conquest. PvP mission in which guild team members must complete various tasks in the conquest game mode. The easy, medium, and hard all have the time limit of 30 minutes, but easy has a combined score of 300, medium 500, and hard 800. For PvP rank, the PvP mission in which guild team members must earn PvP rank points within a time limit. Again, easy, medium, and hard all have the same time limit of 30 minutes, but the differences are easy is 4,000 rank points, medium 8,000, and hard 16,000. PvP Stronghold Missed Champions PvP mission in which guild team members must complete various tasks in the Stronghold game mode. Easy has you summoned two missed champions in 30 minutes, medium is eight champions in 40 minutes, and hard is 18 in 55 minutes. PvP Stronghold Stronghold Lords PvP mission in which guild team members must complete various tasks in the stronghold game mode. Easy has you kill one stronghold lord in 30 minutes, medium is 2 in 40 minutes, and hard is 3 in 55 minutes. PvP win. PvP mission in which guild members must win a certain number of matches in a time limit. Easy is one match in 30 minutes, medium is two stronghold matches within 40 minutes, and hard is three stronghold matches in 55 minutes. PvP top stats. PvP mission in which guild team members must obtain top stats. The easy, medium, and hard all have the same time limit of 30 minutes, but easy has 5 top stats, medium is 10 top stats, and hard is 15 top stats. For PvE, we'll go by each subcategory. Bounties. Each bounty target has either a target with a green shield above their head waltzing through the world, or has a mechanic to find them and activate them. Each one has a specific map they're found in. These either have a route they traverse in a loop, or you have to interact with something specific to try to find them. For this one, you won't know what targets you have until you start the mission, as these are randomized. The easy bounty will always be Poobadoo, Trillia Midwell, or Brekebeck, while the medium and hard will always have an easy mixed in with the rest. The bounty's tier lists are one target for easy, three targets for medium, and five for hard, each at 10 minutes, 
minutes, 15 minutes, and 20 minutes respectively to complete in the same order. Targets can always be gotten in any order, and in order to get personal participation for credit, you will need to make sure you and your guildmates at least get some hits in before it dies so no one misses out. Some targets are far more difficult to find and defeat than others, and you do share these enemies with possibly other guilds searching for the same ones. As the routed ones are just openly there walking everywhere like a normal NPC at all times until someone kills it, forcing it to respawn. If this is missed or failed, the respawn rates are still fairly quick. Sometimes they'll appear close to the most recent kill spot, sometimes they won't. You'll just have to look for them again. Some good tips are separating into groups of at least four or five for DPS and support for the medium and hard, or sticking as one group to find them and kill as you go if you're a smaller group. It also helps if you can spare people to scout for the targets you have, or targets to expect if it's the easy bounty. That way you don't have to spend time finding them as a group while you're working on another target. Also, checking the map you're in for other guilds doing the same bounty, or just asking in map chat if anyone has seen the target you need. More than likely, you'll get someone that will link the most recent area they've been in, or another guild is about to do it that are willing to link the nearest waypoint and wait for you. Though keep in mind, that guild also has their own timer to worry about, so try to make sure everyone gets their ASAP. I've linked the specific wiki page for all the bounty targets, their routes, and any specialty targets in the description. Guild Challenge there are six different guild challenges. If the guild has access to the guild portal, you can give players a free waypoint closest to where the challenge entrance is in the world from the guild hall by going to the portal device in the guild hall, selecting challenge, and ensuring to select the challenge in the map you're going to if there are multiple challenges that week. If not, you just link the closest waypoint for everyone. Once there, there will be a golden shield and light emitting from it for those with permission to start the mission and open it. Everyone representing the guild will be able to walk into the glowy flag that pops up and select the guild they're going in with. This will default to the guild being repped and select yes. While you want everyone in, you do need to make sure you open it, enter, and interact with a guild initiative representative in a relatively short time or else this will cancel. So I recommend opening it, having an officer stay out and ensure everyone gets in, and once everyone is in, immediately getting back inside. I recommend only the ones organizing or an officer talk to these NPCs as well as mechanic buttons, as this will prevent anyone else from entering or continuing if done too early. These challenges are Blightwater Shatter Strike in Blaze Ridge Steps, Destroy all crystal nodes before the first regenerates. Nodes regenerate 30 seconds after being destroyed. They can only be damaged by special Charzukas, according to the wiki, though I have noticed some AoE can damage them as well, although I don't think it's supposed to. I recommend either having a separate small group shoot each node equally and make sure they all burn at the same time, or go in as a group and get all of them to about 15 to 20 percent and then splitting off to finish them all at the same time. There will be five of these nodes you will need to make sure they die at the same time. You will have branded enemies trying to stab you while you're shooting at the crystals, so just have some heals, protection, and small AoE with you as you'll still have access to your utility skills along with the Charzuka. Usually, if done quick enough, you won't have to worry about a kill squad protecting those using the Charzuka, but this is an option. Your Charzuka skills will be 1. Fire Missile 2. Jump Left 3. Jump Forward 4. Jump Right and 5. Heat Shield. I personally use just 1 and 5 for DPS and protection. The time limit for this one is 20 minutes, and this is the general map where the nodes are. The Charzukas tend to pop up around the arrow. Branded for termination in Fields of Ruin. Destroy 3 targets at the same time. Targets revive 30 seconds after they're killed. You will want 3 groups of people with decent DPS and a condition damage crowd control squad in the middle where the ogre spawns, as this one almost always takes the longest to CC and kill. Just ensure the other two destroyer bosses don't burn before the ogre is ready to be killed. Get them all low and then burn together when everyone is close. Each enemy spawns in these three places. A devourer on the lower platform to the left and to the right, reachable by this plank, and the ogre in the middle on the ground level in this little canyon. The time limit for this one is 15 minutes. Deep trouble in Mount Maelstrom. Rescue and escort 10 quaggins safely. If any quaggin dies, the whole mission fails. Make sure to stay in the play area and not accidentally swim to the outer red ring. This will kick you out of the instance and can sometimes be easy to not notice until it's too late. It tends to be best to run this in groups of three to five, at least to run multiple quaggins, as each quaggin can take about two to three minutes each. All Always escort them until they disappear, as there will be a group of freight that will still attack them right before they're safe. The time limit for this is 10 minutes, so getting multiple escorted safe quaggins going at the same time is necessary. These are all the locations for each quaggin. Some are underwater, some are above, and some are higher up in the boats. Save our supplies in iron marches. Basically defending 20 barrels in the center of a hill with three basic sides full of enemies running up the hill to get inside and destroy said barrels. It's best to have three or four on each side to make sure nothing makes it. The enemies will get harder to kill and eventually try to evade you and run for the barrels anyway, so just be cautious. If able, it's nice to have a small group inside to catch any stragglers, just maybe one or two. There are technically defenses you can use if you feel like, though I believe most guilds just DPS everything down before they get in. The timer on this is unfortunately long, 
but as long as your people are vigilant, it should be fine. As long as you have at least one barrel left at the end, you're good. There is an easy out of bounds area to accidentally get in, which will kick you out. So just make sure you're waiting for enemies to get closer to you. You have 11 minutes and 40 seconds for this one. I've gone ahead and marked each general area to look out for and where you should typically have people stationed. Scratch sentry defense in Timberline Falls. Basically just tower defense with three lanes defending a scrit at the beginning of them. Four waves of fairly easy enemies that are just honestly fun to see how quickly they can be burned. If any of the three scrit die, the mission fails, but even with two or three smaller groups of three or four, this should be fine. Two of the tunnels are connected in a U-shape if you're low on numbers and everything spawns from those two close caves inside. So if needed, you can just have a small group just in that one connected tunnel and just kill both mobs. It does help if you can mark each tunnel and place people into subgroups, each with their own marker so they know which tunnel to go to. For the most part, enemies will spawn from the opposite side of the tunnel from the script, but I wouldn't go too far in since some can spawn closer. There is no timer on this one, and here are where all the script are, my markers for them, and all of the caves where the enemies come from. South Sun Crab Toss and South Sun Cove. Basically pick one person you can trust to hightail it away from enemies and just on the outer part of the inside of the ring that pops up. This person will not be able to use any skills outside of tossing the crab, which can be done, but most guilds tend to just have one crab carrier and everyone else kills the enemies and keeps them away from the carrier. It also helps if you have two or three people that can help protect, heal, and speed up the crab carrier. You do not want too many people around them as it will just gather enemies to them. Guardians, Mesmers, Rangers, Elementalists, especially running an Oromancer build, which is just support and movement, etc. are all fantastic for using as carrier protectors. The challenge fails if the crab carrier is downed, the crab falls to the ground, or if the crab is moved out of the circle. You just need to survive for five minutes, but sometimes it can feel like the longest five minutes of your life if you have a small group. Guild Puzzle same way of getting to these as the challenges, just if you use the portal device in the guild hall, select puzzle instead along with ensuring the correct map is chosen if you have two puzzles. There are multiple rooms with either a jump puzzle or a different type of puzzle in each room. After each room is completed and you run into the next, to a certain point or interact with the next thing, the previous room will close. You will want to make sure you get everyone in the room before moving too far or hitting the next interactable. Otherwise, you'll risk people getting left behind and having fewer members to continue working through the rest. If you die to fall damage or anything else in these, by the way, let someone else get to you and res you. If you try from a checkpoint, you'll be teleported to the beginning of the puzzle and be locked out of the rest of the rooms. You'll still get credit, but again, this goes into the issue of possibly not having as many people as you need later on, as the final rooms tend to need the most. For the same reason, Mesmers and other portal users are a great idea, especially if they're comfortable with jump puzzles so they can grab anyone that falls. I will include any portal-specific classes and skills at the end in the general tips section. Along with this, while you can try to take the closest waypoint to these instead of the guild portal, more often than not, the closest waypoints are contested. The guild portal will try to take you to that closest one, but will reroute you automatically to the next closest one should it be contested. These puzzles have an overall time limit, but also sub time limits for each room or else they reset. There are three guild puzzles in total. Angvar's Trove and Snowden Drifts. Of all the puzzles, this is the one Mesmers tend to be the most useful. This puzzle starts off with a jump puzzle where people often fall just below the bridge. Simply jump around the side to the left or to the right, though most tend to use the left. If you have a Mesmer or a thief that can portal people up, simply have anyone that fell wait just below the bridge you land on to make it easy. The next room is more of a timed puzzle. You'll have three people, preferably one of those being a mesmer or thief, that will grab bows from the rack and shoot down icicles from the ceiling. The rest of your group you'll have below on the ground to catch icicles and be ready to fill the vent holes around the large rock formation closest to the wall the bow users are on. Make sure you've got everyone holding one and at a vent. Once all vents have a person with an icicle, tell them to plug the holes at the same time. This will then cause the rock from that section to float up, allowing bow users to jump on. It tends to be best to shoot plenty of icicles ahead of time so people can continue filling ASAP after the first rock formation is done. Continue till you're on the second formation and then shoot the big icicle on the ceiling in the center. If you want, you can even damage it before this point until it's almost done, but not break it until you're on the second rock. Then continue with the other rocks as before and get across. Light all three torches at the same time. These rock and ice platforms will not stay up for long, so it's important for people to shoot, ground level members to fill, and to get across as quick as possible. In case one falls at the end, it's good to have a mesmer to portal people up to help with the torches or just continue on. Once the torches are lit, the door to the right will open. After that, it's another jump puzzle room with a very long drop. Jump around and down and across the room and down to the floor level across to an ice tunnel and up the tunnel while avoiding the snowball that would be rolling down that will knock you back and pull you down. You can hug the wall in certain areas to avoid this. Continue up and across the ship with an extra loot chest on the ship, up the mast and to the bridge. After that, it's the ice gate and explosion room. If anyone falls below the bridge, by the way, make sure that your mesmer or thief are jumping up and down as the ice will hide whatever portal you're using or at least try to get 
get it up onto the snow where people can see. In this next room, you'll use barrels to get through the ice walls, and there's a canyon you can use to destroy them as well. There are tons of barrel sections throughout this room, and the cannon is up a set of stairs at the back of the room. The kegs are timed, so it's a good idea to have someone do the cannon and have everyone else use the farthest lane close to the cannon and not pick up barrels till the second barrel interact section in the maze. This way people can focus on one or two ice walls and ensure everyone has plenty of time to get a keg to the last wall, where the cannon cannot reach. Once that last wall is completely broken, then the cannoneer just needs to run through before the ice walls respawn as people are using kegs on that last ice wall. It's also a good idea for the Mesmer or Thief to lay a portal from inside the next cave tunnel and try to lay the other end of the portal close to the cannoneer as possible, just in case. Then it's another two rooms of jump puzzles, with one of them being accessed by a cave underwater after jumping from the first room. After that, the final room is where you need the most people. There are six animal totem shrines, eggs, torches, and a broodmother, along with the same six shrines on the other side of the room on a platform. You will need six dedicated people to grab torches and each sit at one of the animal shrines waiting at the unlit bowl at the larger part. One tankier person needs to grab a drake egg then to kite the broodmother around to each of the brazier bowls at the far end of each shrine, as the broodmother will breathe fire to light said braziers. Once a shrine is lit, that torch bearer will light their torch using the brazier they're closest to and go on to the other side of the room. The shrines have animals on them, so all they need to do is match the animal they were at with the same animal shrine at the end. These animals are Bear, Doliak, the longer face with backward facing round horns, Minotaur, with a smaller face and frontward horns, Raven, Snow Leopard, and Wolf. Have all the torchbearers wait at the end, and once all the end shrines have their corresponding lit torchbearer by them, light it at the same time. This will open the door and everyone will get the prompt to accept credit. It helps in the last room if you have any extra people healing torchbearers and the egg carrier, but try to make sure they don't break any eggs running around with AoE. Langmar State in Plains of Ashford. Of all the puzzles, this one is the least needy of a portal user. There's no place to really have to save people from since it's all pretty straightforward or you start on the level anyway. You'll simply run down a ramp in the first room or eat yourself off the edge and try not to die and enter the second room. Once everyone is in, press a button to start the room event. This is basically just a game of rock, paper, scissors, but instead of using your hands, you'll search for weapons at the weapon racks on two sides of the room behind the statues. You only have to fill the char statues. These racks can spawn either a weapon or a ghost. If it spawns a ghost, you will not receive a weapon from that rack and should move on to another. Out of the 12 racks, only three will give players a weapon, but when you do get a weapon, follow this to place the correct weapon in the hands of the correct char. You will look at the human statues to see what weapon they have. Char bow beats human sword, char sword beats human staff, and char staff beats human bow. Once the door opens, enter the next room, which is just having two people run up the stone and wood ramps to the left and two to the right, and having them stand on the stone pressure plates at the top of these at the same time to open the gates. Quickly run into the next room to find a set of six curtains when you first walk in, three on each side. There are also six corresponding curtains toward the back and upper sides of the room that will require some minor jumping to get to from the stairs. Essentially, people will pull the curtains on the ground level to reveal paintings of humans doing an emote, which the people at the upper curtains then need to do to open their curtain in a certain time frame to open the next gate. There is an annoying NPC named Byron, by the way, that will walk between the ground level people and sometimes get in the way of people interacting with their curtains in time. So try to pull when he's not on someone. You have a time limit of five seconds from the first curtain pull to pull the rest of the lower ones. After that, the people up top have 45 seconds to guess either the emote they have by spamming any of the options or by having their course responding ground level partner whisper them the correct emote. The emotes are always dance, bow, point, sit, wave, and salute based on the human versions. If you have at least 12 people, you can simply have one person at each curtain. If you have less, you will want at least one person at each of the higher curtains to spam and four or six at the lower ones to pull those curtains since that timer is much less forgiving. Or a couple experienced people up top that can switch to another one next to them or people from the lower curtains that can quickly jump to the higher curtains to help them with the emote using. You have multiple options options of ways to do it with less people just in case you lose someone along the way or start smaller. If you want to do the buddy system and have people whisper each other, these are the pairings of people. One goes to one, two goes to two, etc. After the gates are open, just run to the next room and up the hill to the last one. In the last room, there are three floors here. Top floor you start on has a button on each side of the hole on the floor. Second has deadly gas filling the room and has exposed gears that need to be lubricated with ooze juice from killing oozes. And the third level down has a door with a fallen column where you need to build a ram to take it down. To build it, you need to kill ghosts and search for carts to find parts. So in order to do this room, you need to keep at least two people up top to stand 
hand on the buttons with preferably a buddy with them to help kill the ghosts that may knock the players off or kill them, or have people that are tankier with stability that can keep themselves still, as anyone moving from the button will then allow more gas to fill the rooms below. Once the top level team is set, everyone else will drop down and kill the oozes to get balls of ooze to then grease the gears and keep them running. Keep some people here still greasing while the rest head down to find parts for the ram. Once the ram is built and the door is down, everyone is free to drop down to the bottom level, go through the door, and accept credit. You have 20 minutes in total for this one. Proxemics Lab in Brisbane Wildlands. This is the longest one. As far as numbers go, Proxemics is probably the least needy though. If you have a minimum of four, and obviously more will help a ton in the third and last rooms, but even just having seven or eight is perfectly fine. But a Mesmer or Thief will greatly help here since there are two jump puzzle rooms, one of which is more difficult and can easily lose people. This puzzle starts off with leading you to a room with six alcoves, a central structure on the floor, and a button by the next door across from where everyone came in. Each of these alcoves will have a glowing junk pile. The idea of this route is to search those piles for glowing batteries and bring six of them in two minutes to the center structure. You will find either a battery or a junk item called a shiny. If you get a battery, all your skills will disappear, you'll be slowed, and you cannot dodge. If you get a junk item, you can run normally and have the option to throw a battery in a targeted spot. The previously mentioned button should be left alone by everyone but the person who will start the overall puzzle, as this starts the room and causes Skrit to appear and then run after people with any found batteries and knocking them back, causing them to drop and lose the battery. These Skrit are coded as friendly and cannot be wiped to protect the battery carriers, so what needs to be done is to have anyone who instead found a junk item to throw said item somewhere to distract the Skrit. I personally always play it safe and throw these junk items around the edge where the central structure is, so Skrit have a longer time to run back to any nearby battery holders. Obviously, the more people you have, the faster this will go and the less you have to worry about the Skrit backhanding people around. Once the door opens, have everyone book it into the next room. The second room is a jump puzzle. If you are a mesmer or thief and are comfortable with a minor jump puzzle, continue up the fallen column and across the room above while having anyone not confident or just having lag issues simply jump to the floor level and running to the end to await a portal. Once across, keep anyone that made it from above from going into the next room ahead of time and grab anyone that either fell or were rezzed or just ran to the end and bring them up. Have everyone pull into the next room when you're ready to move on. The next room will have a large device in the center in what looks like lasers and hologram animal images on the lower part. Six more alcoves along the outer wall with empty hologram screens above them and a button to the east exit. Once the button is hit, this will cause the empty screens above the alcoves to randomize an animal image. You will have 45 seconds to find those animals in the screens behind the lasers in the center structure, interact with those to transform yourself into those animals, and run into the matching alcoves with your transformations. You will have three rounds of this. You will know an alcove has been completed by a vertical bright blue bar filling a previously empty dark outline with in the alcove and a deep singular beep sound. If there are any that still don't have a blue bar in them, they will still need to be done. If anyone enters an alcove with a transformation and it still does not complete, try to ensure they are using the correct animal, as they may be using one that looks similar but not quite right. For example, someone using a bat as opposed to another small flying transformation. If someone walks into a completed alcove, whether or not they have the correct transformation, nothing will happen and they'll have been an animal that still did cardio for no reason. Once all are done, the next round auto starts. After all three rounds are finished, the next door will open. Be very careful getting everyone out, as the button to start the next jump puzzle and room is right outside this door with a very, very short platform and a small drop. Hitting this button then starts a jump puzzle with hologram tiles. Again, if you have a portal user, try to get them across and portal anyone else that needs up. If someone misses, they can technically climb up the sides of the room and press the button again, but keep the timer on the room and overall puzzle in mind. If you don't feel confident in jumping, just wait for a portal. If you don't have a portal user, try to get everyone that fell to do it together again. You'll need at least four people on the pillars at the end of the room, as these have pressure plates on them that open the next door. Keep these four on the pillars and get everyone up to the next room, and then everyone else jump in. From here, you'll want to head up to the upper left room. This will show you the view of the last room, which is a huge maze. Up top is that vantage point and the button to start the room. The lower area everyone came from is the actual way into the maze. Hitting the button will cause six beams of light to emanate from randomized areas of the maze and cause the lower door to open. These lights come from containers with energy orbs that need to be found, grabbed, and ran to the last room in the top left corner of the maze and inserted into empty containers there. Once all six are found and deposited, the last room will open. A few things about this maze. There will be damaging traps, scrit, and a singular cat golem named Tom Nine that are enemies and will try to kill the players. There are also smaller walled off vantage points reachable by smaller stone stairs through the maze to see any other beams not visible from the large vantage point at the start of the room. A great way to help members find these, if you can, is by marking these areas with glowing 
commander markers. Group attack marks on the minimap, personal jade waypoints, or whatever else to mark the map. Commander symbols tend to be the best, as you can hover your mouse over where you see a beam and press one of Alt through 9 to place a unique glowing marker that's both visible in person and on your minimap for everyone in that squad. It then also allows you to call it whichever symboled ones have been gotten and which ones haven't yet. But of course, this requires someone with a commander tag. There are also breakable walls throughout the maze, so if you cannot get to one by normal means, try to see if there are any walls to break down. Two good tips for this maze are 1. Having your minimap zoomed in to see the actual pathing of the maze, and 2. If you can, splitting up and doing a buddy system to break down walls faster and to defend the other slash give them speed or portals if you can, as grabbing an orb will get rid of your weapon skills. You can still use your utilities skills here, however, so try to ensure you have any blink or teleport skills, any condition cleanses, or anything else to protect you on your way to the end. People can see that you've grabbed one by the beam of light coming from your orb. Once that last room opens, head on in and accept credit. There is a fun little cheese box in here you can take cheese from, by the way. The puzzle has a 20 minute timer. Guild races. All of the guild races will include players turning into some sort of animal to make it through a bunch of pairs of flags in an obstacle course within a time frame, while trying to avoid enemies that will try to kill you and take you out of the transformation. If you have this happen, and you're living, you can just restart from the beginning. You only need to make it through a few pairs for personal credit, though a certain minimum number of people need to make it through entirely to complete it for the guild. If you happen to make it through the end and are not taken out of the transformation, you may have missed a pair of flags and will need to backtrack if you want to complete it. You can reach these races through the same way as the puzzles and challenges if your guild has the portal in the guild hall, just with a choice of race and the correct map. Otherwise, as usual, just go to the closest waypoint. Thankfully, these are things anyone can participate in once activated, regardless if they're in your guild or not. So this allows multiple guilds and even randoms to participate toward the same completion goal and help each other. This is great for smaller guilds that may not have the numbers to get everyone through enough times on their own before the event times out. To start these, just go to the glowing guild race marker at the start of all of these when the mission is active and start the race for your guild and open it for the map. All players will then just select the flag that pops up, hit yes, sign me up, and off they go. To end it, you just talk to the guild initiative representative at the end of the race. If you happen upon a map instance where it's already 15 out of 15 completed and the event is still going, you can still do it for personal credit, not have to finish it, and as long as you get an officer or other guild member that has permissions to start or end missions through the end, you can end it there for your guild and still get credit for the entire guild. Some general race tips are after you get through a few flags or make it through, if there's enough people to help finish it, try to run through and kill whatever mobs you can while healing and protecting others that are still transformed. Try to not stay mounted near these players, as they won't be able to see traps or anything else. But Jackal's one skill will give a significant health barrier, so jumping on these players just before dangerous traps or rockfall spots can help a ton and be the difference between someone having to start over and possibly being that last person you all need for completion in time. Each animal transformation will be different for each race, but you'll usually have skills to help you move, hide, or heal, or search for certain traps. We'll go over each of these skills in each specific race's section, but there's one very important one most of them have. One, search to basically have this echo location type skill that will show you all nearby hidden spike traps in smaller red circles on the ground and any nearby rockfall hazards that can immobilize you in larger red circles. You can also control right click this skill to set it to auto use whenever the cooldown is over so you don't have to remember to hit it. Bear Lope and Lorner's Pass. Turn into a bear cub. You'll have three main skills aside from being able to exit the transformation. 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Eat leftovers. Consume a leftover to regain health. Removes one condition. And 3. Snowball. Roll yourself into a ball of snow. Increases health and grants immunity from crippling. You will have some optional bonuses along the way like speed and invisibility. Your rooms of enemies will be frost bats in the beginning. Ice worms that hurl immobilizing ice balls at you in an ice room. Cave trolls that can summon small cave rock falls. Rawl and flesh reavers. And finally ice imps. So you mainly the ice worms through Grawl and Flesh Reavers will be the most useful for race runners. I will show the wrap for said race here. Chicken Run in Fields of Ruin turn into a chicken. Your skills are 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Run. Run as fast as you can and gain health. And 3. Throw feathers, which is hide yourself in a flurry of feathers. Your enemies will be mainly harpies, then breeze riders and drakes, a lot of separatists, and finally some griffins. Killing mainly the harpies and separatists first will be the most useful for race runners. I will show the route for said race here as well as a helpful side tunnel you can take to avoid traps as a chicken. Crab Scuttle in South Sun Cove. I'm gonna be honest, this is my least favorite one. Turn into the crab overlord you secretly are. Your skills are 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Threaten. Raise your claws in contempt. Grants a speed boost and confuses and provokes the target. And 3. Crab Shell. Blocking incoming attacks for a short time, mainly used against Karka hatchling bundles that are unavoidable otherwise. If you see them get near you, just bunker down and use 3. There are plenty of traps from the start you may not be able to avoid, so just do your best. You will also have some areas in the beginning that will drastically 
drastically change your camera view and basically shove your face in your crap's butt. Oddly enough, try to aim your camera even more underneath your character and it'll oddly pull your camera above to see any traps and where you're going. There are two tunnels you can take later on, one of which will have two routes for it and one that's far faster. This is a great race to use the Jacqueline as you cannot help race runners with the Karka hatchlings, but you can give them health barrier to protect them. I'll show the route for this race with those tunnels here. Devourer Burrow in Diesa Plateau. This one is probably the easiest and most straightforward of all races. You turn into a Devourer. Your skills are 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Play dead, which is trick your enemies by pretending to be dead. This skill can be cancelled by movement. And 3. Burrow. Burrow yourself into the ground, hiding from your foes, which then turns into return to the surface. Dig your way back to the surface, becoming visible. I'll show the route here. Ghost Wolf Run. This one is my favorite race. Turn into a ghostly wolf. Your skills are 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Ghost Leap. Leap forward and gain regeneration. And 3. Ghost Howl. Grants Aegis and Swiftness for up to 3 nearby allies. You'll have quite a few traps and rock falls in this one as well as human separatist enemies. But there are a lot of places you can absolutely glide through, as if you have the Gliding Mastery unlocked, your wolf will glide with the wings oddly vertical. Just make sure you actually make it through the flags instead of just over them if you're gliding. At one point, you'll go through a waterfall and up this mine and a wooden platform. Some bits you'll need to use your ghost sleep for. I'll show the route here. Quaggan Paddle in Frostboard Sound, the only underwater one and only one without a search function. Turn into a Quaggan. Your skills are 1. Dart, dart forward gaining Aegis, and 2. Purge Conditions. Purge all your conditions and gain health for each one purged. It's fairly straightforward, but you have a lot of enemies trying to kill you as well as tons of bombs that will unfairly kill you and can totally be triggered by other people nearby or cause you to be another person's blubbery meat shield. You'll be going for small underwater portal looking things with the flags on either side of them instead of wider areas with the flags along the walls. Killing literally everything, including the champ worm close to the end, will greatly help all of your racers, especially the worms and urchins that hurl things at everyone. The route is as follows. Spider Scurry in Dredge Haunt Cliffs. This one is more complicated, but is honestly fun to do. Turn into a spider and make your way through a ton of dredge with the following skills. 1. Search as mentioned in the race's summary. 2. Web Decoy. Create a clone of yourself at the target position on traversable terrain to distract enemies. And 3. Leap your Spider-Man that can also teleport through the bottom of platforms. This will be used to get up through and across a few platforms, some optional, some not, as well as getting across certain distances. Just ensure you aren't missing any flags. It's important for people to be killing Dredge on the first platform area and on the middle, at least. There's also a Coriteria Mastery Insight on the second wooden platform. The route is as follows. Trex. Play hide and seek with a glowing circle in the world. These are fairly easy and just require you to look at the picture and name of some of the spots in that specific guild mission tab that randomize once you hit launch mission. Some of these are easy spots you can probably guess, like the ones in major racial cities, some are underwater, or some are underground, in buildings, and others will be significantly more difficult or just straight up in jump puzzles, one of which causes some guilds just to fail the mission and restart in hopes they don't get it again. The wiki has all of these spots, how to get to them, and if there are any special things you need to do for some. But for the most part, when you find one, press F or whatever else your interact button is, or just click interact and it'll complete that one, giving you personal credit as well as anyone else standing on that circle with you. More often than not, it will take a second for these to register that you've clicked them, some taking longer than others. It's been a thing for a long time, just take it into account. While you will get that personal credit, in order for the guild to complete this, you will need to get all of them done. One person with the wiki can fairly, if not very easily, run through the easy and medium mode ones depending on what you're given, but I do recommend having at least three or four guildies for the hard one. I have most of the locations memorized after years of running these, but even with my memory and the wiki, I can only get about half or just over half of the 30 needed for the hard track. There are 186 possible locations in total. These do not have to be found in order, just like the bounties. As long as these are all grabbed within the time frame, you're golden. It tends to be the most helpful if people can communicate which ones they will grab. If you do not need guild credit and are only doing treks for the personal accommodations for your members, you can simply just have everyone grab their own as they want, or in groups, or you can organize and have everyone go to one easy location. Just link the waypoint everyone needs to take or get to, get to about 5 to 10 feet away from the spot to where you can see it, but no one can interact with it at all due to distance. Ensure everyone knows to not get onto it until everyone is there, have everyone stack together on it when it's time, and have one singular person hit the interact button to ensure no one hits early, causing someone else to miss. Things that help with this are 1. Having backup locations in case someone does miss or doesn't have a location. 2. Commander tag symbols to show either where to go or where to stack together to wait. And 3. If players have mounts, have them mount up. They'll still get credit 
inside it as long as they're on the circle, but this will help mitigate anyone accidentally interacting early. There will be some locations, however, that will not have the space for players to mount up in. General Guild Mission Tips and Tricks 1. Setting up at least 30 minutes early and having a general set time for missions. This lets members that want to participate plan it out and have time to get whatever they need done beforehand and makes sure that everyone knows they'll have a set time to be in the guild hall or in the group to begin. This plus being consistent helps you as an organizer and is considered a common courtesy to those in your guild. Try to keep common nights other guilds do theirs as well in mind should you need help with races. Most guilds tend to do theirs on the weekend or smack in the middle of the week too, keeping portal users on hand, mainly for puzzles. 3. Keeping the wiki for both the bounties and treks on hand. You can absolutely just slash wiki something in game chat to pull up the wikipedia page for it, but it always helps to have full pages on hand. For example, slash wiki space Brekebeck will pull up the page for the bounty target Brekebeck. 4. Commander tags are incredibly useful. There are extra symbols to use, like for showing where to go or for stacking. You have more options to organize into separate subgroups, and subgroups can use party chat if they wish instead of the entire squad chat. This is useful for things like linking a waypoint where a certain bounty is if a group of you is looking for the same one together, but you don't want to confuse another group in your squad going after a different one by linking yours in general squad chat. It's your own private chat amongst yourselves so you don't interfere with other teams. If you're an officer training to do guild missions for a larger guild, want more options, or just want to see what all the commander tag offers, see my guide here linked in the top right hand and in the description below the video. 5. Things like Taco or Blish HUD can have certain pathing packs to help find bounty routes, treks, etc. These are legal by a add-ons from fellow players to make life a little bit easier in general. Links to both sites in the description as well. Some guilds have their own packs for just their guilds and some are public. Portal user skills. Mesmer. 1. Portal entry. Place a portal in your location, go to another location nearby, and use the same skill again. This will allow people to traverse between the distance no matter the terrain, with a limit of 60 seconds to place it, keeping cast time in mind, with the max amount of people being able to use it at one time being 20. People have 10 seconds to use this portal before it times out. If 20 people happen to use this, the portal will then time out anyway. 2. Mimic. This basically makes a copy of the skill you're about to use and negates the recharge time. For example, if you were to want to use a portal again directly after the first use, you can prepare this by using the portal entry and getting ready to place the other end as usual by clicking Mimic right before the second portal portion. This will automatically recharge the portal skill to use it again once people use the completed portal. And the alacrity will also help recharge skills. Thief. 1. Prepare Shadow Portal. Pretty much the same as the Mesmer Portal. It's just literally named, colored, and animated different, but even the prompt for people is the same. You just have 5 seconds to use the portal as opposed to Mesmer's 10, and 5 allies as opposed to Mesmer's 20. What 2. Now? Spectre, which is the elite specialization added by End of Dragons. Using the trait Traversing Dusk in the Spectre Elite Specialization, Lion turns all Spectre-specific utility skills into things that also give alacrity. These are called wells, the same thing that Mesmers have. Thief currently has more alacrity wells than even the Mesmer. So while thieves don't have a mimic ability, they do have the potential to use the portal almost immediately just with a severely reduced recharge rate from using the wells constantly. So in all, the Mesmer can grab more people short term, but because of the alacrity wells, Spectre still have the ability to portal a good amount of people for a consistently longer time. Necromancer, specifically the Scourge Elite Spec. Sandswell. Wherever you stand as the player will be one side of the portal, and wherever you place the AoE Sandswell is where the other end will be. You will auto-teleport to the other end almost instantly after placing it. This will give the players the same prompt as the other portal types. It has 20 uses aside from you insta-teleporting to the other location where you place the AoE, and has a very short 8 second duration time to use. So you then need to use your own portal again to get back, as well as anyone else coming with you. So that leaves 19 people capable of using this other than yourself at one time. This has a very short cooldown of just 28 seconds to help mitigate this, but it is a line of sight AoE to place rather than a two-step capable of traversing different terrain. Something like this would be useful, say, for the ice wall room of the Angvar's Trove guild puzzle if you're trying to ensure the cannoneer running after everyone else makes it to the other cave in time. I think that's everything. I know it was a lot of information, but I hope this helped with any future guild mission running or helped you understand them a little more. Huge thank you to the VIP clan over on the NA server for allowing me to record most of this footage so I can have a clearer reference for you guys. If you'd like to join my guild for my community, consider joining the Discord and simply putting your Guild Wars 2 account name in there. Have any tips or tricks not mentioned in the video? Please feel free to share them in the comments. Want to catch me live? I usually stream Guild Wars 2 two or three nights a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, or Friday late nights from the link below. Happy accommodation farming!